Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mariah Mitchell Association's speaker series for the month of July. It is such a pleasure to welcome our featured presenter this afternoon, Rita LaDuke, and I will share a quick and brief bio on Rita and what she will be presenting for us this evening. And just as an introduction for myself, I'm Jean-Al Gurley, Director of Science and Programs, and it is such an honor to welcome Rita this afternoon. Rita is originally from New Jersey's Pine Barrens, and she's an interdisciplinary artist living in New York's Hudson Valley. Her overarching practice is led by spirited explorations into ecosystems, environmental, human, and organizational. In all of her work, the Duke's process is one of examination, absorption, participation, as well as becoming. Along this ever-evolving process, she uncovers pathways of understanding and possibility. In addition to Oika Expedition Nantucket, current engagements that Rita is involved in include Ecology Extended, an Oika collaboration with Dr. Rich Blundell at Hubbard Brook Exper Experimental rather, Forest, sorry, Groundwork, Interdisciplinary Retreat, The Place Collective, Arts at FSML, and additionally, Oika endeavors. And it is with all of my gratitude and all of my pleasure to welcome Rita to our speaker series event this evening. Welcome, Rita. How are you? Thank you so much. I am very well. I will turn it over to Rita to introduce her presentation for us this evening or rather this afternoon, because this is a re-recording, a second run and spin around the sun at our speaker series, which was held in a hybrid format earlier this week on Wednesday evening at seven. So we get to do it again, and I'm enjoying spending all of this time with Rita. All right, day two, here we go. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you so much, Janelle. And thank you, Mariah Mitchell. Thank you, Oika, Rich, um, Joanna, like just everyone. It's it's awesome to be here. I'm, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to talk. I mean, normally there's scientists here giving talks and the bar is set pretty high. So I just, I hope I can do it justice. Um, so I'm excited to be here uh, and we're gonna jump right in. All right, let's make sure that this works. Cool, okay. So, um, probably not dissimilar to a lot of talks at Mariah Mitchell. I'm going to start with a Mariah Mitchell quote that I'm, I'm basically going to build the whole presentation off of. Um, so this quote, mingle the starlight with your lives and you won't be fretted by trifles. So this quote stuck out to me because it resonated as something similar to something that I believe. Um, so I'm going to offer my own interpretation of this quote, you know, who's to say what Miss Mitchell was saying, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and run with it. Um, so what I think is that Ms. Mitchell is advising us to ground the cosmic in the earthly, and that if we do, the earthly becomes universal. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, well, the point of this talk is to explain what I mean by that, um, and I'm going to do it through the lens of my creative practice, both individually and collectively with the cohort of, of Oika, the art. Nantucket. Um, so I'm going to start with just a quick background. Janelle just gave a really nice intro, but I'm going to just do a real quick one. Um, and then I'll talk about my individual practice within the context of this exhibition, which is kind of the mingling the starlight with my life part. And then I'll interject with some more universal themes, um, which are themes that are present in the project of Oika and themes that we worked with as a cohort for this particular exhibition and other collaborations that we're doing kind of around the world. Um, and that's the part that I think these universal themes bring us the result of not being fretted by trifles. So just a quick note on Oika. I know we're in, there's a variety of audience members here. So some people are familiar and some people are not. Um, you can see in this slide on the left, there's some different sites throughout the world that Oika projects are being enacted right now. Um, so OICA is not an organization, it's more like an organism. And what I mean by that is that it is a collection of ecological principles, concepts, and people who maintain nature-grounded practices. And when I use the word nature, I mean it very broadly, it's a problematic word and we need a different one, but just 
nature, I mean it very broadly, and then ecological principles, we're talking like from deep time cosmic evolution all the way through, you know, present day ecosystems. So, so that's kind of one definition. And then it's also appears, Oika also appears as the curatorial through line of the residency cohort and resulting exhibition at the Mariah Mitchell Gallery. And so just again, for people who don't know, there is a cohort of four artists, Robert Peters, Dina Hayden, Dakota LaCroix, myself, and then our curator, Dr. Rich Blundell. And we started this project almost a year ago. And we, we had a residency at the Mariah Mitchell Association where we would periodically come back, we go back and forth and, and stay in communication. And then that culminated in the exhibition at the gallery. Um, that just closed last week. Um, and then just a note that kind of the, the lead principal investigator of OICA is Dr. Rich Blundell, who's an ecologist, and he's the current Mariah Mitchell scientist in residence. So whenever you hear me say Rich, that's who I'm talking about. Okay, personal background. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist. I study systems and relationships, just as Janelle described. Um, what the reason I leave that pretty vague is because I typically work with place. And then what ends up happening is those places teach me things. And I am trying more and more to not just keep that between myself and the place, but to try to help that get that to sort of trickle up into human systems and relationships and organizational systems and relationships. Um, so I was born in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. While there, um, just strongly reinforced was the importance of art and nature. So that was very much embedded in me as a child. Um, I went to school in Philadelphia and then in Chicago, then back to New Jersey. I lived in New York City for seven years. And then in 2018, I moved up to the Hudson Valley. So I'm very close, I'm in close proximity to the city, but I really felt a calling to kind of get back to my roots in the sense that I needed to, I needed to live in the woods again. Um, so back to the art and nature. It was like I had the art in Brooklyn, but I didn't have as much of the nature that, that I grew up with. And so that's where I am now. Um, so, so while I was moving, doing all those things, what I was studying was visual art. And then I was working in theater. I studied theater as well, but I was a set designer um, and a scenic painter. And that's like what my day job was while I was studying painting and drawing. When I went to graduate school, I kind of combined those two things and became an installation artist. And now, you know, I am what I am. I just don't do it. So, so I just wanted to point out that the through line here is site specificity. And at every step of the way, even when I was studying painting and drawing, I was taking my paintings outside and, and uh, like scrambling to draw tree shadows. Like it was always very much a collaboration with place. And I, and you know, as young as 20 years old, I remember describing myself as like a conduit for, I was collaborating with this place and it was like speaking through me that I was sort of really just the tool that the world was using. Um, so I still feel that way. And so now I'm teaching, I teach at a couple different universities, Rutgers, Ramapo, William Patterson, all around the, the New York City area. Um, I started Groundwork Retreat in 2014, which is an interdisciplinary retreat that spans beyond just interdisciplinary artists, but scientists, you know, the arts and the humanities. Um, I work with OICA, doing a lot of collaborations with Rich and with the OICA community. Um, and then other interdisciplinary endeavors. So I just tend to gravitate toward places that welcome multiple perspectives. Um, I think that that is a critical move in order to unstick us and come up with some new ways to move the needle here. So I'm, I'm interested in, in any of those kinds of endeavors and I try to get in there whenever I can. Okay, so a little bit about my individual practice before I get specific. Um, it's a holistic connection to place. This is what I endeavor to do is to, I call it a process of acquaintance to acquaint myself with a site. Um, and so generally the steps to do that are to listen. And then through listening, I start to absorb. And then eventually that leads into me participating with the site. And ultimately I feel like I become one with the site. So I've been doing this at a bunch of different places. Um, you can see this process that I'm showing here is a process of what I call like visual data collection or qualia collection for the, maybe the scientists in the audience. Um, but I have a clear sheet and I bring provisional materials 
and I look through the sheet at the environment and I start to respond to the environment with my materials. And so um, I'll, I'll talk about this more later because it'll come into play with the work on Nantucket, but I just wanted to show um, how with this process, I'm really zooming in on those relationships and, and really like immersing myself in that place. So it's kind of this call and response. And so I'm, I'm able to get more specific, like there's a call and response with like blades of grass or, you know, birch trees or chain link fence or like a mountain range in the distance. And so I get to zoom in to different elements of the ecosystem at different scales. And what I'm, what ends up happening is I'm, I'm capturing the essence of the place. And what I mean by that is I'm capturing the physical essence of the place. So some of these marks capture, you know, the cracks in the salt basin. Um, I'm also capturing the phenomenological elements of the place. So some of these colors or gestures capture like the wind or the temperature of the place. Um, and then I'm also capturing the psychological elements of the place. So, you know, there could be a neon color because of the mood that the place is giving me at that, at that moment in time. So I think the takeaway here is just to, to know that I'm using myself as a sensor. Again, this like kind of conduit thing, but, but maybe it is more than a conduit because I am, I'm sensing the things that are coming through me. And then when I make decisions to then make marks, those marks are evidence of the things that I have sensed. Okay, so in order to take you to Nantucket, because everything is relational, we do have to start a little bit earlier at Hubbard, Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. So we're going to rewind to 2021. So Rich and I met in 2019, um, and we wanted to do a project together, and it, and it kind of came to fruition in 2021. And we were invited to come to the Experimental Forest and meet up with uh, the current PI at the time, Lindsay Rustad, and she took us all around the forest. I mean, this is a you know, 8,000 acre um, forest where they are studying just like you name it, like forest ecosystems. So watershed data, there's an ice storm experiment, there's a nitrogen investigation. I mean, and essentially what they're doing is looking at tipping points and baseline shifts. Um, and so it's, a, so it's a lot of focus on climate change um, and watching the forest as it responds and tries to figure out how to kind of adapt. So deep immersion into place. And so I made a lot of work through the past two years and we have an upcoming show at the Museum of the White Mountains in October that's going to be showing all of that work. Um, but I just wanted to put these in because they're kind of fun um, and just say that that body of work is mostly focusing on this climate science and the focus on tipping points. They talk a lot about tipping points where they're studying the forest and different aspects of the forest and how the where is it in the change where there's kind of no going back. And so I was thinking a lot about that. I was thinking about the feeling of anticipation kind of pre-tip. Um, and so I made these gifts to kind of illustrate, uh, again, using the different materials that I had collected throughout the forest um, that kind of illustrated that feeling of like the, the tip, that, that shift, that's, that change that's happening. Okay, so while that was happening, um, you know, we go to the forest, we do, mostly we do work in the morning into the afternoon, and then we'll go for a hike. And that's like our kind of research. Um, and so what was happening, like I'm doing research on tipping points and baseline shifts and making work about that. Um, but we're going on these hikes and, and, and inevitably, as we would come back, it was like a certain time of day. And Hubbard Brook is a valley. So, you know, the brook runs through the valley. And as the sun was setting, there's a one particular place that they call it the gorge because it's very, you know, it's, it's a, you know, the, the pitch is much steeper. Um, and so what's, what's also gorgeous, like you can't quite get there because of the rocks, but the sun would kind of, the sunlight would get trapped at this particular time of day. And we'd be walking back from the hike and it would just feel like it was like asking us to, to come, to come in. It was like beckoning us. Um, and so I started making work about that, about, this idea of zooming in but like this work was about the idea of zooming in but what was still kind of lingering for me and what i felt like was maybe the next phase of that conversation is like what did the act of zooming in reveal 
and and what I was starting to get to was that it's not a tipping point, but a line. And so and so this was just kind of in my head, like while while I was kind of finishing up the the tipping point work. Um, and so I want to just kind of stop here and say, this is one of those moments where I kind of just like ran headlong into an Oika concept. So this happens quite frequently where, you know, my brain is kind of like thinking about things and I'm learning about things and like these metaphors are showing up and then it's like, okay, continuity. So it's not a point, it's a line. What is this telling me? This is telling me something about continuity. And that's one of the Oika concepts So this. Again, these moments where I'm gonna kind of zoom out to these universal themes, I think to answer Ms. Mitchell's suggestion about the trifles. So we'll, we'll return back to these. Okay, just to explain a little bit more what I mean by it's not a point, it's a line. Um, in, in my kind of art brain, this is how I think about it. So, you know, in foundations of drawing, you talk about value scales. And so at the top here, you can see a 10 step value scale. It goes from white to black. And it's showing, you know, the steps of gray that you would take in order to get there. Um, on the bottom left, you see a graphic image. This graphic image is high contrast and it engages only two tones on the value spectrum. So you see black and you see maybe maybe like a, a two or a three, you know, whatever. It's the background of the of the slide. Two colors, kind of dual, right? On the right side, you see a graphite image. It's low contrast and it engages the whole value spectrum, which by the way is infinite. It's not just 10 steps. Um, now, the question here is which is more realistic, the graphic image or the graphite drawing? I think we would all agree that the graphite drawing is more realistic. And so what that's telling me is that there's something about continuity that is gonna present us with a wholer understanding of reality, okay? So I know here I'm like talking about like drawings and then I'm, I'm shifting dimensions and moving into like the real world. Um, but I do that a lot and I'm gonna talk about it more. So get used to it and I'll explain it a little bit as we go. Okay, so enter Nantucket. Um, I got there with an open mind. Like I was, I was, you know, I had this kind of conversation about points becoming lines, but that was at Hubbard Brook. And I didn't, I didn't wanna put that onto Nantucket if Nantucket didn't want it. And so I went there very open, met up with the rest of the cohort. Rich took us on an earth story walk, which is, you know, walking through the terrain of Nantucket while learning about the cosmic story, like from the mystery to the big bang to today. Um, and I'm taking notes, I'm taking these notes. And, and I just, you don't have to read these notes, but, but things that popped out at me, um, Rich, I can't stress gradients enough. Gradients make life happen. The fact that we can move is because of gradients of electrical charge in our bodies. And then he goes on to talk about nutrient gradients. So, you know, as you pass through a threshold, you gain complexity, right? So like zooming in, you're, you're zooming in and things are just getting more and more complex, much like a point becoming a line. So it was just kind of inescapable. Um, and then as if, as if, you know, I needed any other sign, as I was um, returning on the ferry, I just looked straight up ahead of me and, and saw this. It was like, oh, right, Nantucket is the gray lady. So, you know, it just was very clear that this project needed to be about grays and gradients and continuity and um, spectrums. And so what I ended up making was kind of three separate series of work. And I'm going to take you through those briefly. Um, there are collages. There's a series of 10 collages. There's drawing. And then there's some outdoor pieces. Okay. So I went back to Nantucket and I was like ready to dive in, ready to really explore the grays. And so the question that I came with was how does the character of the literal color gray change as it traverses from the gray ladies port and downtown area into the forest and moors? So again, quite literally watching the actual color gray as it goes from like the open gray sky, the foggy gray ocean, the gray shingles, the gray cobblestones. And then as you move into the forests and moors, you start to see the gray um, eelgrass. You start to see the gray roots. You start to see the gray 
trees and the qualities of the gray change, the gray is constantly present. And so what can be unearthed in an ecosystem's gray areas? Something was telling me that if I study this physical gray and I like listen, absorb, persist, participate, become, it's going to tell me something about this metaphorical gray, this, this ambiguity, this continuity of life that stretches across fractals, dimensions. Um, and then another question, what do I find when I keep zo zooming in? If I zoom in further and further, do boundaries even exist? Like, so, so just interrogating the idea of continuity. Is there, is there an end here? Um, which, you know, just in saying this, this is reminding me of, which has a whole thing about Planck length and how, you know, that's kind of a, a decided number, but in reality, you can keep zooming in more and more, right? So again, just another, another point where like science and metaphor creative thinking actually kind of are consilient and end up finding each other. Um, uh, here's just a quick video that Dakota took on one of our excursions um, showing myself collecting some of the visual data. This is in Nantucket. This is in um, what Rich has called the Enchanted Forest. So that okay, the idea. So I gathered visual data on site in the form of photographs and this process. Um, and then I went back to my home studio in the Hudson Valley. And so you can see kind of in the back middle, a pile of my visual data that I collected. And then you can see kind of around that sort of an arch, all the photographs kind of organized. Um, and then in the front, you can see the little 10, so there's 10 four by four pieces of paper. And I had, I had a suspicion that the um, downtown area had requirements for colors. And so I looked it up and sure enough, um, you know, there's only specific colors that you can use to paint the architecture in the downtown area. And so um, what's funny is like, it looks very gray when you're physically in the downtown area. But when I was actually matching the swatches, um, it was like really blue and green. Like there, the, the color was already starting to surprise me. So that was really exciting. But what I did is I made swatches, swatches of those colors, and then I cut them into shapes that matched shapes of architecture and environmental structures from my photographs. So that's where I got the shapes for the like monotone swatches. Um, and then again, like Oika concepts here. So timeless play and tacit knowledge. So while I'm in the studio, I'm playing and I have my data and I have my like, like I have physically absorbed the, the the phenomenology of the place and so there's something in me that i'm trusting while i'm playing um and so the boundaries of of all of that start to kind of blur too like what i know cognitively what i feel what i've brought back from nantucket kind of in my body and my being um and then the physical things that i actually literally brought back from nantucket um and so i'm just i'm just playing and i'm trusting that because of these multiple ways of researching and understanding that something authentic is going to come out, that the place is going to continue through this work because all of the ingredients are still so tied to the place. So here's just an example of like a close up of the piles when I distributed the photos, the swatches and the visual data. And so um, I think it's like, number three and four on the left and then these are numbers nine and ten on the right so you can just see how crazy it starts to get and how like color starts to show up and here I was thinking that I was collecting the grays I mean obviously I'm using green and yellow too but like it just like it's inevitable like you just it just happens right so this that's part of it is like leaving again this timeless play like leaving open space for surprise and and just trusting that like if if I feel like I need to use yellow while I'm trying to capture the grays, the yellow shows up. And then what's that going to do later? We'll find out. Yeah, so here I am, again, just like still more of the process kind of chaos. 
and and this idea of kind of organizing chaos and see what kind of comes up and becomes important and relevant and what just like feels like it clicks as as sort of conforming to my experience to the place and the conversation that we're having and 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 that this click kind of actually is is the conversation continuing and it would be fun because like I would think that I created number four and then I would create number five and then I realized that number four is actually number three and then I have to create a new number four and so it was just always it was a constant dialogue of just call and response and and feeling and you know intuiting and and just kind of trying to figure things out um so yeah it was really a joy because it it surprised me so much um and and so this is what i ended up with and so you can see it's a 10 step quote unquote value scale um that goes from pretty geometric pretty um kind of non-organic like like kind of calm what is the word like monotone in a way um all the way out to like the the very organic enchanted forest just a little bit closer here's steps one through five you can see like shingles texture starts to show up um angles start to go beyond just you know right angles they start to get a bit less predictable um but it's still mostly straight lines and then you get the eelgrass in number five that's starting to you know stray away from the straight lines um and then this is six through ten And what was really exciting was it like it really actually mimicked because then when I went back to Nantucket and I drove again like after making these when I drove again from the downtown to the enchanted forest I could feel the change in my body and so that was really exciting as a way to almost like check it and it checked out for me because it's like only my experience okay um so now I'm going to shift take a sip I'm going to shift to the drawing, um, which also has a, a companion collage to the right. Um, the collage itself um, is sort of like a singular version of what the 10 step scale did. So if you go kind of from the top left down to the bottom right, you sort of take the same journey that that 10 step scale just took you on. Um, but I just want to say here that it's really important in my practice to use a variety of materials and mediums and processes. Um, because if I'm trying to really understand a place, I need to understand it in different ways. So different ways of seeing, feeling, moving, and learning. So the more perspectives, the more ways of kind of perforating the boundary between myself and the place. I, and this is how the participation turns into becoming. And I'll, I'll keep talking about that. Maybe it'll make sense by the end. We'll see. Anyway, so the drawing is just um, very, very detailed graphite. And it was also kind of like, well, I'm studying the gray. So, you know, the, the collages studied the gray in one way, but another way of studying the gray is to use a gray material and, and really try to respond to the different values with that gray material. And then additionally, like the drawings are really slow and meditative. And so it's just a much different practice than, you know, the collages or the data collection outside um i'm like teaching my muscles the rhythm and the direction and the gesture of the place um so it's just it's just really informing me in a different way wish i could zoom in on that oh i can yeah so so it gets so yeah much different way of working All right, so this brings me to the last body of work, which is the outdoor pieces. <laughs> I'm gonna play this video. Um, okay, so this is something that I am kind of, this is a practice that I'm building on and obviously it uses the, that data collection process, um, but then it ends up creating a collage that I then put back onto the origin site. And so um, what I do here is I collect data from hey, there's Rich, from the two different um, vantage points. And so you can see on the bottom left here, the first vantage point 
is like me capturing, there's another uh, telescope that you can't see, it's out of frame, but that is me capturing that telescope. And then the second one is me capturing kind of the, the bushes and the sky in the other direction. Again, that's also off frame. And then the third image on the bottom is those two pieces of data off site, kind of just sitting there waiting to become cut up and turned into a collage. And then the last picture is the collage itself. And so what I was interested in doing here was, um, I'll go to the next slide. Well, maybe I'll stay here. What I was interested in doing here was again, kind of perforating a boundary and, and questioning the idea of the binary of the like black and white, the two perspectives, the two points and trying to see if I could create continuity between those two points. So if I look in this direction and then I turn around and look in this direction, I'm looking in two very separate directions that are opposite each other. How could I merge those two directions? And so that's what I did with the, with the collage. Okay, and then again, while I'm doing that, um, I'm becoming porous and continuous as well. So because of the nature of this process, um, because the sheet is transparent and I'm responding to place, but then I'm like, I'm seeing the place through the sheet and then the place is telling me, you know, because I'm responding, I'm, I'm, it's niche construction, essentially. It's reciprocity, it's niche construction, and eventually cognitive science would call it inaction. Um, but I think niche construction is maybe the most concrete way of describing it, which is like the environment is, is informing me on how I respond. And then when I respond, the environment is reflecting my response in the way that like, when I put something down, I then see the environment differently because of what I put down. And so it just becomes this like very cyclical process, um, where suddenly the boundary starts getting blurred between like what's my contribution and what's the contribution of the place. And so this is what I mean by this like participation turning into becoming. Right, this video might be a little choppy maybe. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to show, it's fine as an image, but I just wanted to show, um, yeah, a, 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 a video of me making the collage. You can see how the data gets cut up you can see data from two other sites up in the corner there. Um, and so I'm, I'm reconsidering the relationship that I, that I pulled from that site. Like there's that conversation that I started when I started the data collection at that site. I take it back with me to the studio. This is actually me at the Maria Mitchell Gallery. And then I, I cut it up and I shuffle it around. So I'm, I'm like reconsidering it, but we're still very much in dialogue. We're actually kind of like reconsidering it together, like me and the place. I'll get back to that later. So this is what the collages became. There were four of them. I'm just gonna show them to you quickly. Um, this one is at the aquarium, the Mariah Mitchell Aquarium. And these are still up. So if you're someone who's listening, who's in Nantucket right now or going to Nantucket, um, these, are, these are still up. Um, this is at Mariah Mitchell um, Observatory. I think it's three Vestal Street. And Dina's sculpture is there too. And uh, Dakota's audio walk starts there. This is the driveway to the gallery, 33 Washington Street. And then this is the one up at Moines Observatory. Okay, so I'm just gonna, we're almost done. So I'm just gonna stop to do something a little surprising because it surprised me because I didn't know about it until a couple of days ago when uh, Rich and I were on island and I'm getting this presentation ready. And he says to me, well, I'll go back a little bit. Um, while I was making this, you saw in the video how he was like sitting right behind me. Um, and he's like, you know what that looks like, right? That looks like the cosmic microwave background radiation. And I'm like, totally gone, just like working focused. And so I hadn't asked myself what it looked like at all. But when he said it, it was like, oh my gosh, like, yes, I could totally see what you mean and this background radiation when you know when when you're learning the story of cosmic evolution right after the mystery this is the thing this is like the first thing that we can see um and it's it's a record of the light primordial light and um it's essentially our baby picture and so what was really cool is like here i was 
at Lloyd's Observatory thinking that I was in dialogue with the place and the present. Um, but what this kind of, it sort of shot me out to realize that I was also in dialogue with space and time, um, which was super cool. But then the other thing that was the surprise from a couple of days ago was I'm working on this presentation and Rich says to me, you know the entomology of the word reconsider? Con, with, together, sideris, heavenly bodies, and stars. So the word reconsider is believed to actually literally mean to look closely and observe the stars again. Um, so Mariah Mitchell in her quote was asking us to quite literally reconsider. And when I'm sitting there and I'm shuffling, you know, my, my scraps of data around and I'm asking myself to reconsider. And if somebody steps into the gallery and like sees the exhibition and, and how all the artists and the, the curatorial statement is like asking us all to reconsider. Um, so I just thought that was, that was really special and cool and I wanted to share it. Okay, so in conclusion, if we mingle the starlight with our lives by getting close, listening, multiplying ways of understanding, absorbing, and actively engaging, participating, we won't be fretted by trifles because we become. We become the starlight, we become the trifles, we become part of the whole, and we can feel the whole as part of us. Okay, so I'm gonna just end with one more quote from Mariah Mitchell, because she's really good at these quotes. Um, we have a hunger of the mind, which asks for knowledge of all around us. And the more we gain, the more is our desire. The more we see, the more we are capable of seeing. So once again, like, thanks, Ms. Mitchell. Just kind of helping me say what I'm trying to say, which is if we zoom in what we find, is infinite continuity of which we are a part. And so this has worked for me. And then the proposition of Oika is that it can work for all of us. And that's what we try to do with our show at this gallery. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rita. Sitting and listening to you for the second time this week, it just, it hits in a more profound way than it did the first time. So, so everybody should watch this twice. Definitely. I'm going to make sure that everyone does. <laughs> should I stop sharing? I think leaving a picture up is great, but you can, if you'd like, whatever. Yeah. Works. I like seeing everybody there. Yeah. I like the group photo. It's a great one. And as a tangent or just building off of your photo, just the gratitude that I feel for all that you've shared with us for spending time on our campus at our facilities and really embedding yourself in the nature of Nantucket and the fiber of Nantucket and learning about the land and then telling a story of your experience here on Nantucket. So I just, I have an immense amount of gratitude for you and the work that you've done and all that you've contributed to our island in your time. In your I would like to point out that, you know, these interdisciplinary spaces, like Mariah Mitchell is special. Like the fact mm -hmm. that you opened yourselves up to a, a group of artists who, you know, were, were playing differently, you know, than mm -hmm. some of the other, like, I think what using Mariah Mitchell's, um, what's the word, like what, uh, what she, how she lived and mm -hmm. modeling the association after that, really makes it a unique place. And so, so I have equal, I reciprocate that gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> and what I would like to do at this point is just transition to some questions that we had during our live session or rather during our hybrid session earlier this week. And if you're okay, I'm going to kick off some questions that we had from those in person. The first question was, what's next for you? what is it or what was it about Nantucket that permeated really and embedded in your soul and will likely inform your future work? So Two-part question. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I remember being excited about this question because I didn't think, first of all, I didn't think when I got there on Sunday, I didn't think that I would have an answer to this question. And then by Monday afternoon, I did, um, mm -hmm. which is just how these things happen. <laughs> 
but um, yeah, so we started researching eelgrass um, on Tuesday, which again was just such a surprise, but we're trying to, um, yeah, we're trying to figure out ways that we can kind of link artistic kind of creative research with mm -hmm. some of the restoration work that's happening on Nantucket through Mariah Mitchell um, to, to, to kind of the, the economic model is to, to relink, to recouple economy with ecology. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, we, uh, Rich took me out on the sailboat and we just jumped right in and started, started doing some research. So, so that's happening. Um, and I think like, you know, the studying of continuity that I did with this work, um, you know, on one hand, I was like, okay, this feels like a big jump. Like suddenly I'm going from researching something kind of very ambiguous and ephemeral and, you know, kind of artsy. And now I'm studying eelgrass. Mm -hmm. um, but what ended up happening was like, whether I was in the boat or if I was like standing in the water drawing, like Rich asked me like, so what'd you learn about the eelgrass? And I was like, well, what I learned about the eelgrass was like, how to how to like like physically feel direction which is something i'm really bad at but i but because i had like my legs in the water you can mm -hmm. you know when you feel the water the waves the direction of the waves or when i was drawing them on the boat and then the boat would turn i would see mm -hmm. that the lines change the angles and so i knew that i had changed direction and so suddenly mm -hmm. the direction of the eelgrass changed and so the direction of the eelgrass had to be in a particular relationship with the direction of the waves Otherwise it wouldn't match. It's kind of like showing a, showing an image where like the sun is shining here, but the shadow is like, doesn't, you know? Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, I learned, about, I learned about that. And I was learning about the, um, the, the, like when I would draw the, because you know, I'm drawing really quickly to try to scramble because everything's moving. But the, the sound of the marker on the page were, it was the craziest thing. It was like mirroring the sound of the seagull cries. Cause they would start slow and then go fast, 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 fast. And then like kind of, and that's what I was doing. And so essentially the answer was like, what I learned about the eelgrass was the entire context of the world that the eelgrass, you know, lives in. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that was just scratching the surface where I was, you know, we were out there for four or five hours total. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to, to keep it going. And there's the continuity, right? Like there's the, there's the gradient is that it's not just the eelgrass, it's the relationships that you know include the eelgrass amazing and are you traveling back to hubbard brook at all yeah we're gonna go back actually in like a month mm -hmm. uh, because we have the show coming up in october so we're gonna do kind of the last bit of prep and research and then and then we'll go back in october that's an ongoing project so um yeah we're hoping you know the thing is again that last quote with you know miss mitchell like the more you look the more you find so this idea that something is ever going to end, I mean, I actually need to be careful because it's like every time I start a new place, it's like I have a new child and I like, I, you know, I can only have so many children, but, but there are different levels of relationships, right? So, you know, and you just never know which one is going to become like a lifelong friend and right. otherwise. So. Continuous. Yeah. They live with us forever. <laughs> The second question that we had earlier this week was around the idea of abstraction. Would you define your work as abstract or how would you describe your body of work? Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, in a very traditional context, you know, yes, the work is abstract, right? Like, cause it is not, it, it's, it's not, yeah, it's, it's, it's abstracted, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's one other word that's non-representational. So I would say that the work is not non-representational. Non-representational means that it's not recognizable as something. Mm -hmm. so I think that in most cases with my work, it's recognizable as something. Mm -hmm. But a more radical answer would be like, no, it's absolutely not abstract for mm -hmm. me um, because what I'm depicting is the physical, the phenomenological and the psychological. And so mm -hmm. if by abstract, you know, you just mean, not you, but like if by abstract, we mean just representing what we can just see with our eyes, then mm -hmm. sure it's abstract. But when we take our entire like mode of like sensing and being, what I'm representing is actually quite what I what I hope is a very accurate representation of the intersection between myself, the place, space, and time. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that way, for me personally, 
um, it's very much representational. Um, and I don't know if it's worth mentioning, but I'm synesthetic. So I, I have a tendency of like really absorbing moments through colors and textures and shapes and sounds and you know things like that. And so um, I think that's partially why I have an easier time blurring that boundary and just saying like, oh, of course it's not abstract. It's like, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, in most cases people would, would consider it abstract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another question was why Hubbard Brook? What brought you there? What connected you to that space and place? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> the, the spaces, kind of again, what I was saying about Mariah Mitchell, like the spaces that have been kind of the most warm and welcoming are spaces where interdisciplinary research is already kind of happening. And so, um, but Hubbard Brook surprised me. So I like, you know, I, as I said, I've been making work about place for a long time, um, but, but I would go to these residencies and I would make work about place and then I would leave and nobody else would care about the places where I was. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to try field stations because I wanted to go places where there were other people there permanently who who really loved that place and so that was I was like looking into that and uh, my friend Leah Wilson had told me to reach out to Lindsay Rustad and so I did that and Lindsay seemed awesome and then simultaneously Rich and I were like we should we should figure something out so it all kind of just like happened um but Rich and I also both have particular connections like like I have just loved the White Mountains since I was a kid um and he spent a lot of time there I think he lived there for a bit too um so again it was just really serendipitous um kind of much in the same way that, you know, Mariah Mitchell was too. Well, we are glad for that connection, that triangulation rather even. <laughs> Do you ever feel restricted at all when translating your place-based interpretation into the drawing media format? What is that process and experience like for you? Mm, right, I remember this question. Thank you, Robin. Shout out to Robin. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the drawings are tough. Um, I mean, I'm a super, I mean, I, I like almost majored in math. So like there's part of me that is very kind of OCD detail oriented um, and structured. And so so I do appreciate the play between like the drawings and the looser work. Mm -hmm. um, but man, sometimes, I, you know, I'm in the middle of the drawing and I'm just kind of like, why did I decide? Like who decided to make <laughs> this drawing? Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're slow going, but it's also learning to appreciate that slowness uh, and what it's teaching me because changing speeds really does a number on that listening part and that absorbing part. Um, so again, like, as I was saying, like the, just the gesture, moving my muscles, figuring out what that gesture, it's like writing, it's like figuring out how to write a new language, right? So like, you know, figuring out how to how to draw the bark, that particular bark in the enchanted forest, or figuring out the lines that I need to make to create the waves. Um, it's a learning curve. So every time I change a section of the drawing, like a new learning curve starts. Um, so it's not the same kind of surprise as the collages where I'm kind of constantly getting sort of, ex sort of like, I'm constantly a, a conduit for this like surprise that's kind of just coming through me. Um, it's a it's an elongated surprise, which actually asks me to activate my trust too mm -hmm. in a different way, where I gotta just like I have to just do it, and I just have to go into it, and then by the end, you step back, and it's kind of this this feeling of surprise in that moment, like a download. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you're the conduit for the download coming through from nature. <laughs> yeah, but it just, it's another kind of zooming in. I get like, you know, like, cause it, cause it takes longer. So it's just like, elongating. Right. you take the, all these little surprises that happen in the, in the more kind of intuitive um, mm -hmm. works and you can take one of them and you stretch it. And that's like the, the drawing process. It's gotcha. kind of nice. It's rewarding to zoom in on that, you know, but, yeah. but it's not instant gratification for sure. <laughs> No, it's rigor and it's like discipline mm -hmm. and it's um, important, right? Those two things are really important. Definitely. And that's your math background coming in there. <laughs> Another question that I believe I had for you was what advice do you have for budding scientists and artists mm -hmm. who experience the distinct paradox of not crossing art into science? 
how can we intersect art and science in the lives of the future generations? Hmm. So yeah, this is, um, Rich and I gave a workshop, it's an OICA art science leadership workshop that we gave to a lot of the interns, the Mariah Mitchell interns on Monday. And this was kind of the focus of that workshop. And the question for me, first of all, I mean, I think the, the, the first answer is just play, like play a lot. And again, like elongate that process where you don't expect, I think part of, I'm so excited that interdisciplinary collaboration and art and science in particular is like having a moment. Like, I think it's long overdue. We need to have it. Um, but I, I don't want us to rush into it because when we rush into a collaboration, what starts to happen is it starts to get static. Things start to become expected and like processes start to become designed. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a matter of really kind of keeping it as open as you can which is just counter to what we're taught, right? Like we're taught that like, you know, and even grants, it's so hard to get a grant that doesn't, you know, they're, they're always asking like, well, what's the outcome gonna be? And so what I'm suggesting is, is not, maybe not going to be, not gonna land very favorably for the, the, the funders, right? Which is part of the problem. But, but really what we need more of is time and space to play in a parallel way. So we talk about parallel play with um, like babies. Um, and, and that means like when they sit next to each other and then they don't quite have the social skills to, um, <laughs> which is funny because like artists and scientists may not have social skills, <laughs> they don't quite have the social skills to like directly inter, you know, interact, right. but they're still affecting each other. Mm -hmm. And then as they develop and as their own play develops, then they start to engage. And so that, I mean, you can see that happening in this presentation. Like, there's science in this presentation. There's a lot of stuff that like Oika, Rich, you know, the cohort all taught me in this presentation, mm -hmm. um, but it has bled in kind of through like niche construction. Right. So, so it just takes time. And so I think like the goal is to like, if you have like a scientist and an artist, instead of trying to make something that does this, how do you leave space to make something that actually does like this? How do you level it up into like a new emergent space where what you create together is something that you never could have expected until essentially until it, it came into being. Mm -hmm. um, that's just about leaving the, the ground needs to stay really fertile at all times. It needs to mm -hmm. like never kind of get packed in maybe until the very end. Again, this is like a hard thing to do. And I think it's especially hard because a lot of us, you know, we're in an urgent time, like mm -hmm. we don't have all the time in the world. Um, and we're also, you know, we're conditioned to want things quickly. Like everything happens yeah. fast now. And so I'm advocating for something that's gonna take a lot longer and um, take a lot longer and not have like a, a clearly stated goal. Like that's, that's not an easy sell, <laughs> but, um, but I really think, and I know the Oika community also believes, I mean, the, but look at nature, like this is just, how, again, ecological intelligence, that's how it works. So I'm only, I'm only repeating things that, you know, the world has taught me. And, and I think that we should maybe take a tip from the world. Right. And it's interesting that you say that because I feel like education, the world of education can oftentimes be really rigid and we love to put people into categories and boxes. So it's like, I'm a math person, I'm an artist. And I think that there's room for both of those things to be true. And I just remember you sharing with me that it's so important that even if, and maybe I even said that, even if the muscle is slightly underdeveloped in that space and time, it does not mean that we can't give space and time to keep flexing the muscle, to build strength with. Right, because like, right, we said like, how crazy is it to say like, well, I'm not good at that, so I'm not gonna do it. Like, what? right. No, and, and you know, to your point about like about first of all categories. I mean, any this perforating boundary thing. I mean, this is I, it's just my jam. Like, no matter what, uh, the what's that word? No matter what dimension, right? So like dimensions of disciplines. Yeah, let's break those boundaries. While also like, you know, we are experts in our field for a reason. So like when you know Rich and I work together so well because like he stays in the science lane and I stay in the art lane. But then sometimes something comes up where I'm like, wait, you know, I'll ask a question about science or he'll ask a question about, so we're not, we're not rigid, but, um, but we know what we know, and then we learn from each other. So it's like, it's that kind of balance. And then the last thing I'll say is, 
during that um, workshop on Monday, what I was so struck by was these students, first of all, your interns are amazing. I know you know that. Um, mm -hmm. But they were talking about their backgrounds and their paths and what they're studying. And they were so interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of, they could feel a pressure. They were talking, kind of speaking to a pressure to try to kind of hone in on and figure out. But I was so impressed with how long they were able to hold on to their multitudes. Um, and it just, to me, it, it spoke to how natural it is for us to actually hold multitudes and how um, this idea that we essentially be like, it's, it's, there's a, there's a fractal of reductionism here that we're like, we're being asked to whittle ourselves down to a part of ourself in order to pursue a career. And, and there's practical reasons, you know, economic right. reasons why we have to do that. Um, but I, it, I was just heartened, you know, I felt bad that it was still hard for them. Um, but I was heartened that they seemed to hold on to their multitudes for longer. And I was hoping that, you know, maybe that was a sign for the future that like, we are, welcoming like not generalists but we're yeah we're just welcoming more mm -hmm. of the whole being um in a at least in an educational context if not a professional right context. i almost liken that and not ever to oversimplify any one's work but i liken it to the image that you showed us at the beginning with the contrast it's like we we almost not force ourselves the scenarios set for us to be really binary, like things are black and white, but where people really live is in that abundant spectrum of the graphite, right? Not everything's always one shade and we should be multidisciplinary, you know, and have the space for the multitude. So I, I draw symmetry with it. And like the word that just popped up when I'm listening to you was unnatural. Like it's mm -hmm. unnatural to ask us to turn into the graphic image. Right. What feels more natural is the graphite image. And then right. just looking at the word unnatural, again, this is like the proposition of Oika, which is that like, look at nature, nature mm -hmm. has that answer for you. Like, right. what is natural? Natural is the continuum. Yeah. Right. Awesome. And what parting advice do you have for us here on Nantucket? What were your big takeaways? from our community, from our island, from nature? Ooh, I feel like you changed, if any, of course. <laughs> me off. You changed that question a little bit. So now I, this is good. I have to come up with like a fresh answer. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm, I'm really, cause now you just said that and I just, my brain just journeyed from like downtown to the forest. Like I just mm -hmm. did the, the journey of the, of the collage. And um, I just got this like, visceral feeling of kind of smoothing that boundary um and so i i did you ask me what did i learn from nantucket yeah what were your big takeaways yeah i think that like feeling that shift because nantucket you know it's a it's a bit of an island of extremes in some ways um and so to go from the downtown out into you know it's so kind of populated downtown at least in the summer and then to go to these like very remote parts of the island um and there's people on vacation downtown you know like it's just again extreme like there's people you know ex extreme joy extreme like being human or something and then and then you go and you see this extreme kind of rugged natural forest and um what ends up happening is it kind of they start to meet like so 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 like instead of a line it becomes a, a circle like that's that's the next step, you know, because eventually that does happen. I'm not answering your question, but I think, you know, there's just something about what's that. I don't know if this was Rich's quote, there's a quote, like small island, like, like these things that happen on the island are really, they're these little containers that can then be taken off island and applied um, elsewhere. And it's mm -hmm. a really kind of, it's a really amazing space because it's a small, even though there's a lot of people in the summer, it's like a small community to kind of do these experiments and studies and then kind of think about how did the, how does this apply, you know, elsewhere. Um, so that's a gift. I think that that island, I don't know, I'm rambling, but like there's, there's just, yeah, there's a lot there um, that I guess I'm like really excited to, to keep exploring. I think the one that just the thing that I said in the last the last time this question was asked a little bit differently, um, which was like parting advice. I think it was something mm -hmm. like that. But 
I do want to say that I think like this kind of creative engagement doesn't have to just be in the realm of art that like Mm -hmm. there's something about this creativity and kind of zooming in on the points and interrogating the line that I would encourage like it's applicable for everyone just in their lives so anytime we feel like we're stuck with like points that, that are immovable try to use our own innate creativity to ask ourselves how can we make these points lines and maybe shift the points around a little bit in our lives you know like just in like our day-to-day structure the balance of our lives we feel like this is when I go to work and this is when I make dinner and this is when I take you know take my kid to wherever and this is where like those things are actually um dials you know how can we and that's a creative process is questioning those and trying to adjust those and of course there's some immovable you know qualities but anyway I would just encourage this is a talk about art and I'm giving you know I'm showing you a bunch of art but like these creative skills can be applied, you know, deeply into our lives. Amazing. Well, Rita, I just wanted to say thank you again so much. Was there anything else you wanted to share with our viewers, with me, with anyone, all of Nan's are good? (laughs) No, Janelle's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Janelle's amazing. Oika's great. Mariah Mitchell's great. Come talk to me. I want to talk more about it. Um, Yeah, no, thank you. This is, this is just fantastic. And you need an honor and a pleasure. (laughs) I just wanted to say that I really hope that we see more of you on our campus and that we have many more collaborative opportunities alongside you because it would be phenomenal. Thank you. Well, with that, it concludes, or rather, those closing statements conclude our speaker series for this afternoon because it's afternoon now, but it would have been evening. And I'm so like, routine to say evening. So it's good for me to break habits and patterns. I just wanted to say thank you again to Rita LaDuke for all of her expertise, her knowledge and her passion of her work, sharing that with us and welcoming us into your process. Thank you so much. Thank you. And of course, thank you to Dr. Rich Blundell for curating the Oika for Artists program. And that just wrapped for the month of June. And go ahead. Online. Um, so maybe we can link that wherever um, this ends up getting posted that people can see the work so definitely I would love that yes and also a huge thank you to our sponsors Bank of America our lead sponsor Cisco Brewers of Nantucket and White Elephant Hotels and Resorts our alternate sponsors who make this complimentary speaker series accessible to everyone as well as possible so with that I thank everyone and I wish you all well with gratitude thank you